Hey, I'm Dr. Mike Burkhead, and I wanted to make a video for my patients to explain the basics of what you need to know to start losing weight. Now, this is going to get posted on YouTube, so consider it educational purposes if you're not a patient. And I call this video The Law of Conservation of Mass. Like I said, if you're not a patient, consider this for educational purposes only. Here's my disclaimer. This is for my specific patients established with me in clinic. I'm saying all this because I have to cover my legal liabilities. And like I said here, although this information may be helpful to anyone who's obese or overweight, it is designed primarily for people that are under my care and who I have the opportunity to work with directly one-on-one -on -one and provide more nuanced information and care. Even if you have appropriate physician supervision, this information may still be harmful to you in some limited uh, situations, such as if you're prone to an eating disorder, if you have significant metabolic abnormalities. I include diabetes here, although some of my patients will have diabetes. This may be harmful if you lose too much weight or too quickly, if you have nutrient deficiencies, if you have inborn errors of metabolism, if you require anabolic metabolism for healing, like if you're recovering from a surgery. And there are many other conditions where this information could be harmful. If you're looking to lose weight, find a doctor who loves weight loss medicine. So let's get right into it. How do you lose weight? If you consider everything that goes into your body, all the nutrients, you can break it down into two groups. We can simplify things really quickly. You have macronutrients, macro means large, and you have micronutrients, micro means small. And if we just cut these two things in half, and we say for weight loss purposes, we're not talking about micronutrients. We just completely get rid of this whole side. This is a simplified picture, but this is, this is a, a way of understanding it the easiest. Now, I say it's a simplified picture because there are things in the micronutrients that help your body to increase your met metabolic rate. For example, you have to have chromium. Chromium helps in sugar metabolism. But by eating more or less chromium, you're not going to really change how much you weigh. If you just focus on macronutrients, you will change how much you weigh and you will change your overall health. So there are three main macronutrients. You have your proteins, your lipids, and your carbs. And all three of these things have one thing in common. We'll take a deeper look in exactly what each of these things are. So proteins are made up of molecules called amino acids. Here are just a few amino acids, and what I want you to notice is the little carbon atoms. How many of them are there on each of these? There are several carbon atoms. Now, I'm not going to circle all of them because you can see them with your eyes. But every time there's a letter C in this molecule, that represents a carbon atom. And when each one of these amino acids joins together, carbon to nitrogen, it forms a peptide. And as the peptide gets longer, it becomes known as a protein. And I put little lines here to show you where each one of them have connected together. So this is an amino acid this is an amino acid, this is an amino acid, and so on and so forth. And in these little circles, every time there's a corner in organic chemistry, corners represent carbon. That can be seen more clearly down here. So we can think of proteins as being made up of primarily carbon with some nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen thrown in. Now what about lipids? Here's a picture of a triglyceride. A triglyceride is a type of fat, and fats are a subgroup of lipids. And what you'll notice is a lot of carbon atoms. So here's a string, one string of carbon, another string of carbon, another string of carbon, all attached to a glycerol molecule, which also contains three carbons. And though you might recall in chemistry that a carbon atom can form four bonds, and it's basically obligated to form four bonds, and so you can see that this carbon right here, for example, it is connected to another carbon and another carbon, and then it's connected to two hydrogens. So it'd have a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. I said that to explain what CH2 was, not just carbon, it's carbon with hydrogen attached to it, but it's all in a long straight line. 
So fats and lipids are essentially carbon. And I know what you're thinking. Carbohydrates. Carbs. I bet you're thinking it's going to be carbon. And you'd be right. So here we have a carbohydrate. What carbohydrate means is if you have C, that's carbon. What's hydrate? Hydrate is water, H2O. CH2O, you have a certain number of those all strung together. So this is a molecule of glucose. It's C6. H12O6, or you could say 6CH2O, carbohydrate. And so, like I said, you're right. Carbohydrates have carbon. Fats and lipids have carbon. Proteins made up of carbon. And I don't want to forget about the last thing. It's not really a macronutrient, but it counts in this carbon category. This is a molecule called ethanol. You know it as Budweiser, Miller Lite, Fireball, vodka, tequila, whatever you want to call it. This is the molecule that causes intoxication. It's ethanol, and you can see it has carbon in it. And since these all have this really odd similarity, I'll just add this as a non-nutrient macronutrient. I call it non-nutrient because these three things are necessary for survival. This thing is necessary for drunkenness. It's not necessary to get drunk. Now, I'm not bad-mouthing people that drink alcohol. I'm just saying that it's not necessary for life. You can go without it or you can drink it. All I'm saying is you have to recognize that it has carbon in it. And ultimately, the question is, what happens to the carbon? So the carbon, you have a pile of carbon right here, and you have a little box and you, uh, you put the carbon in, it can either stay in the box or it can get taken out. So if you put more and more and more carbon in the box, the box is going to get heavier and heavier. And it's going to continue getting heavier until you start taking out the same amount that you're putting in. I know that things are already clicking in your head. And it might have become obvious to you that because all of these things are carbon, they can be changed one into the other. So when we talk about diets, for example, does it make sense there's a lot of low-carb diets? Does it make sense to have a low-carb diet when your body can turn a lipid into sugar? In a moment, I'll explain why that seems logical to some. But now, now that you know that this can become this, and this can become this, you might start to see what happens to the carbon. It gets stored as fat. So really importantly, how does the fat leave your body? So you put this donut in your mouth, it goes down into your belly, and it gets processed. All of those carbon atoms get taken up into your body. They typically will either get used as energy or stored as fat. So the question, how does fat leave your body, is the same question as how does carbon leave your body. And there are some general truths. In general, you can't sweat it out. In general, you can't poop it out. In general, you can't pee it out. What actually happens Fats, lipids, carbohydrates, they all get broken down into a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which has two carbons in it. Those two carbons go through a metabolic pathway in your body called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, depending on what biology book you're reading. And in that, they get turned into two molecules of CO2. So then how does CO2 leave your body? The question is, how does fat leave your body? The answer is, you breathe it out, which seems really profound because some people, we use terms like burning off the weight, which makes people think that if they get sweaty and hot, they will lose fat. It's actually not the case. You actually burn more calories when you're shivering, when your body is cold, your body's heating up trying to stay alive, than whenever you're hot and your body is trying to cool, rest, and just let the heat dissipate. 
But that's not even the really cool thing. The really cool thing is that you really, it's obvious that doing things that make you breathe harder and heavier and faster are things that cause fat to leave your body. So I have a few implications. Implication number one is what doesn't go in doesn't have to come out. You eat less carbon, you'll lose weight. You have to metabolize carbon to get it out of your body. That means you have to work it off. Uh, you can't actually lay in bed and lose weight as long as you eat no carbon. That's true. And thirdly is that diet fads that convince you to eat more of one kind of carbon but less of another are dumb. Think of Atkins and Paleo, etc. If you eat a pound of butter but eat zero glucose, your carb balance, your carbon balance, your calorie balance is still out of whack and all you've done is clogged your arteries. So bye bye Mr. Atkins. Now the thought train behind this is the lower your glucose levels are, glucose signals a hormone called insulin. Insulin. Sorry, I almost misspelled it. Anyhow, insulin is a hormone that signals for the storage of fat. It causes fat to go inside of lipid cells, fat cells, and be stored. And yes, it is an anabolic hormone, meaning it causes weight to be added to your body. So by getting rid of the glucose, you get rid of the insulin, you get rid of that signal that causes weight gain. But this signal, insulin, is only as powerful as it has an effect on your appetite. Because if you don't eat extra carbon, it can't store the extra carbon inside of fat cells. And yes, insulin does have a profound impact on your appetite. But by eating a load of butter to get rid of that excessive appetite, you haven't done yourself a favor. So in science, the law of conservation of mass says that mass or matter can't be created or destroyed. It is either added to or taken away from. So this is mass. We can either add it to or we can take it away from. If we add more without taking out any extra, we gain weight, we gain mass. On the other hand, if we decrease how much we're taking out, without even adding any extra, we will also gain mass. So you can see that what goes in must come out or stay in. If you dramatically decrease the amount going out without changing this side of the equation at all, you'll lose mass. On the other hand, if you dramatically decrease the amount going in without changing how much is coming out, you will also lose mass. So I've just told you probably what your grandmother, your mother, your dad, your grandfather, your uncles, your aunts have told you, your teachers have told you your entire life. If you eat less and work more, you'll lose weight. Specifically when I'm saying work more, I'm saying you do those things that cause you to breathe off more heavily. Now if you just sit there and hyperventilate, you'll pass out because your body has to have a certain amount of CO2 in it to keep the pH levels right. And so you have to be producing extra CO2 as you're breathing heavily. You have to be doing those things that cause you to breathe more. And so I want to introduce you to another word for carbon. We call carbon calories. By counting your calories, the calories that you eat, you're counting the amount of carbon that you have eaten. And by counting the calories of a workout, you're counting how much carbon you've breathed out into the atmosphere. Yep, we're all contributing to the greenhouse effect. I don't know what to say. You have to do it. It's healthy. So all of our macronutrients, all of our carbon-containing foods, are going to be counted with calories. You look at a package, you can Add up how many grams of protein, how many grams of fat, how many grams of carbs. And you can actually multiply that by a conversion factor and it will tell you how many of my calories come from protein, how many of my calories come from fat, and how many calories come from carbs. 
And that number is roughly estimated as four calories per gram of protein, nine calories per gram of fats, and four calories per gram of carbohydrates. So if you look at your, your meal and you say, oh, my meal has 10 grams of protein, it has, it has 10 grams of, of fat, and it has 10 grams of carbs, you would easily say, okay, I have 40, 90, 40, so that equals 170 calories. You do have to be careful because it will sometimes in the label include fiber, dietary fiber in the calorie count, and fiber doesn't actually get absorbed into your body. So it doesn't contribute to the carbon that you were counting for calories, but it's included in labels as calories because they estimate calories by burning things in, in a device called a bomb calorimeter. And based on how much heat is produced, that is directly correlated to the number of carbon atoms and directly correlated to the amount of energy you have to expend to burn off those carbon atoms. And you might have guessed it, fiber burns in a bomb calorimeter producing a certain amount of, of calories. And it's roughly the same as a carbohydrate. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't also tell you that alcohol has 7 calories per gram. I really, truly hope somebody is watching this and is like gasping, Oh no, that's the last four of my social. I'm just kidding. But just remember, 4, 9, 4, and uh, leave this out of your diet. At least while you're trying to lose weight. And if this is the last four of your social, this video is made for you. Or maybe it's the last four of your phone number. It's made for you too. Now I'm going to get into some more, I'll call it high tech stuff, some real medicine stuff. There are exceptions to the general rule. How does carbon leave your body? So I said you can't sweat it out. That's still going to be true. I also said you can't uh, poop it out, but you actually can. There are certain uh, proteins you can swallow as you eat your food that will block enzymes. This under, uh, requires a little bit of understanding how the calories get into your body. So it goes into your stomach, I'll try to draw a stomach, into the small intestine. And right here at the end of the stomach and the beginning of the small intestine sits your pancreas. And your pancreas shoots enzymes in here. And the enzymes break down the fats and proteins, mostly the proteins. And then you also have your liver that sits right here. And your liver hangs off of it a gallbladder. And it shoots bile in here that causes the fat to be emulsified and breaking down and be, become more absorbable. If you can swallow something that will inhibit these proteins and inhibit the action of this bile acid, then you will actually prevent the absorption of some of those macronutrients. Notably, the over-the-counter medicine sold at Walmart, I think it's a, I think it's two L's, maybe it's one L, A-L-I, Ali, I think. It's a, it's a basically an enzyme blocker that prevents the breakdowns of fat. This blocks some of the reabsorption, but it also has a lot of side effects. You get fatty diarrhea or statarrhea. I also said that you can't uh, pee it out, uh, but that's not completely true either. So if your blood sugar goes over the magic number of 180, you start to get a little bit of sugar in your urine called glucosuria. Or... If your blood sugar is suppressed for a long time, you know, about 15 to 20 hours, you start to make ketones out of fat, and those ketones can be lost in your urine, and they usually, they're going to contain some carbon atoms as well. The possible side effect from that, who loves sugar more than we do? Yeast and bacteria. Yeast and bacteria especially, not so much with ketouria, with ketones, but with glucosuria or sugar, glucose, you really are breeding yeast and bacteria in your urinary tract. So if you imagine that there's a certain amount of glucose in your, in your serum, in your plasma, and that, that plasma is being filtered by your kidney, so for every 100 uh, grams or let's say milli, milligrams of uh, glucose is filtered, there's 100 grams that's also reabsorbed. 
and and so we, we will just call this the amount filtered all right and once you get up to about 180 it starts to curve off so as you can see we have this essentially a straight line up through here I'm going to try to make this a little bit better straight line straight line curving off so we will call this the reabsorbed the reabsorbed and the filtered load the amount that was filtered the filtered load will just make a little dotted line on through straight up through the corner that's the filtered load but the reabsorbed is depicted by that dark line and then we'll look at how much is excreted. So if we do this red line, the amount excreted all the way up to a plasma glucose of 180, zero is, secre is secreted, but then we start to get a little splay and it starts to go up in a straight line. There to draw that a little bit better. So what I wanna point out is that the filtered load and the excreted line become parallel after a round of blood sugar of 300. I'm not going to explain all of why this is, but there's this little bend in the line right here uh, that starts at 180 and becomes parallel by about 300. But what you can understand is if I make a little room over here, is that imagine that this is the tube that is filtering all of your, all of your blood and the stuff's coming in here. It's got sugar in it. We'll just make sugar as little circles. There are little transporters all the way around through this tube to kind of pull the sugar back into your body. And at a blood sugar of 300, those transporters are saturated, 100% saturated. That means that at all times, there is always a sugar going through each one of those. And so that any extra sugar that's not traveling through those transporters is going to be excreted in your urine. And I explained that because, uh, like I said, you can get glucosuria when your energy balance is way too high, or when you're insulin resistant, or when you take a medication called an SGLT2 inhibitor, those little transporters that pull the sugar in from one side to the other are called sodium glucose co-transporter number two. There are several sodium glucose co-transporters. And it basically uses the energy from sodium to grab a glucose and together they travel through that transporter. So if you see a medicine that has some prefix and a suffix, suffix of flozen, flozen meaning flowing through your kidney, like empagliflozin, kenagliflozin, dopagliflozin, these are all SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, you might know them better by their brand name, for example, Jardians. The brand name Jardians is the name of empagliflozin. E M P A G L, uh, actually L I F L O Z I N. And what Empagliflozin does is it will block a certain number of these. I'll make the uh, the color different. It'll block a certain number of these risk of, of these transporters. It won't block all of them, so you won't urinate just out a hundred percent of your filtered load. But instead of having that splay starting at one eighty and becoming maximized at three hundred, it could start somewhere of around one hundred to one twenty and be maximized by 150 or 180. So you'll notice that in healthy physiology, we're talking about like a healthy, uh, you know, 10 or 12 year old that has no insulin resistance whatsoever, a normal blood sugar is 60 to 100, all right? And so if you start to get over 100, all of that extra sugar starts to leak out into your urine and so you keep your blood sugar low. This was created for diabetes, but it has a positive impact on weight loss as well. Now I had to erase some of my scribbles because I wanted to talk about ketoyuria. <clears throat> this happens when your energy balance is, well, if you're insulin resistant and your blood sugar is super high, you get ketoacidosis and get 
uh, key to urea that way. Um, so insulin resistance, but it can also happen uh, from another way. Here's a cool biochemical picture to make you think I'm smart. Uh, actually, so I'll just explain what, what's going on here. So it's a picture of a fat and a couple of amino acids, which are both protein uh, uh, pieces. And it's showing that they break down into acetoacetate or acetyl-CoA. Um, and so what happens to acetyl-CoA uh, whenever it's all being used, is it can be used either for energy or it can be used to make ketones. Ketones such as acetoacetate, this one, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. So my point here is when you are burning fat, lots of fat, you start to get the production of lots of keto acids or ketones. You don't really burn a lot of fat until all of your sugar or glucose has been exhausted and you have a lot of it. Your body stores it in the form of glycogen in your muscles and in your liver. And whenever your sugar starts to get low in your blood, your liver will start to release some of that glycogen in the form of new glucose. So it takes a while to get through all of that before you actually start burning fat for energy. But when you do start burning fat, some of it gets metabolized into carbon dioxide, some of it gets metabolized into ketones. It means you haven't used it for energy yet, but you can still urinate it. When there's a large amount of fats are utilized, calories are lost in the form of ketones in the urine. This is a small amount, but it's not insignificant. That's like saying breathing, you know, is insignificant because it's only a little bit of CO2 going out with each breath. It's not insignificant. So we've learned that you can poop and pee out calories by either having a metabolic abnormality using medicine or by fasting. But how long you have to fast? It's not really like you don't have to be um, a spiritual monk sitting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights with no food. Actually, you start to get enough ketone production in your blood by about 12 to 15 hours. And what happens is you've used up all of your glucose, all of your sugar, and so your insulin levels shut down. High insulin says store fat. Low insulin says start breaking down that fat. You break down the fat and it gets used in, uh, as energy and some of it gets converted to ketones because why? Because here's one reason why. Your brain can really only use two molecules for energy. It loves sugar. It can use sugar all day long, any day to make energy, but whenever the sugar is gone, those fats have to get converted into ketones for your brain to use them for energy. So the sugar in your blood, if you were to eat right now and then wait three to four hours, that sugar in your blood is kind of being used up and then your liver starts to release the stored glucose from hour three to 12. And then after that, uh, fat begins to be converted into ketones and energy. This comes to a max uh, you know, a, a steady maximum production around hour 15. Now, when you first, if you first try this, you'd like to say right now, you're not going to eat for the next 24 hours. You will feel terrible because your brain has been using sugar. It has all the proteins ready to go for sugar. It has not used ketones in a really, really long time. And so it doesn't have any of those proteins manufactured to be able to utilize those ketones effectively. So you have to start signaling to your brain that it needs to upramp its production of those ketone utilizing proteins so that you won't, you're going to feel like, you know, crap the first couple of times you do this. I'm not going to advocate that you do a 24 hour fast. That's probably too long. But what I have a lot of my patients and clients doing is I have them doing what's called a 21 and three intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, time restricted fasting or time restricted diet. It's called by all three of those things in various forms of literature. In the popular culture, intermittent fasting is the primary thing used in the research literature, time-restricted diet and time-restricted fasting are the primary terms used. 
21 and 3 means that 21 hours of the day you're not eating. Now, 8 to 9 of those, you're going to be asleep. So you're going to wake up and you're going to wait a little bit longer. You're going to push yourself as far as you can go. And then around 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., or let's say from 5, now let's make it early. Let's make 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. because you waited all the way, all through the day to 4 p.m. 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., eat as much as you want. Eat what you can. Fill up your belly and make yourself feel good so that when you go to sleep that night, you're not going to be hungry. The other option is that you wake up in the morning and you eat from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. You eat as much as you can, as much as you want, as, uh, you know, as whatever you want, as long as it's in general healthy. High, high uh, um, weight to calorie ratio. So I'll explain that in another video. But you eat as much as you can for three hours, and then you don't feel hungry all day long, but you will feel hungry when you go to bed. It's up to you. There are the literature deciding on which one of these methods is better is uh, not conclusive. So right now I tell people until there's more evidence, you pick what's best for you. And I don't even start with this. This would be hard to start on with day one, right? So here's your new diet. Number one, first and foremost, no sugar sweetened beverages. The number one cause of obesity in children is sugar sweetened beverages. You can have black coffee, no creamer, no sugar. I can't really give you a, a good piece of advice on artificially sweetened beverages. Some data suggests that it would be uh, contrary to your goals of weight loss and some data would suggest that it has no effect. So at this time, I say I advise against it if you can, if you can refrain from artificial sweeteners. If you cannot, then, then use artificial rather than sugar. But the thing is that the taste of sweetness in your mouth might cause an increase in insulin production. And so if your goal is ketosis, that might be contrary to your goal. But black coffee, you can have water. Drink lots of water. Unsweetened tea. All of those things are great. Your first week under uh, your new diet, you have a 12-hour eating window. Eat for any 12 hours. Mark that 12 hours. Make it the same 12 hours every day. Don't eat outside of that 12 hours. Week two, I want you to reduce your eating window to nine hours. Uh, well, this is a 7-11 diet. That means from 7 p.m. to 11 a.m., you know, as why some people call it the 7-Eleven diet. You just pick your nine hours. From 7 p.m. to 11 a.m. you don't eat. That's one form of a nine-hour eating window, but you can pick any nine hours through the day. And to be perfectly clear, the nine hours, the 7-Eleven is really an eight-hour eating window, but I'm reducing it by three each week. You can reduce it by a little more or a little less, whatever you're able to do. Then week three, you're going to get down to a six-hour eating window. And by week four, you are at a three-hour eating window. Now, some people can hop right out the door and start doing this right away. And if you can, do it. I commend you. Do it. A lot of people have to have help. And that's okay, too. Because there are things that can suppress your appetite. I'm not going to go into all of that in this video, but... If you come and visit me or you see a doctor that helps with weight loss, you will be most likely uh, have a conversation to decide which appetite suppressant is the healthiest for you. And like I said, what time should you eat? I don't know. Not enough data. Eat during a window that fits for you, but eat at the same time. And like I said, there are various uh, pieces of literature that would suggest one time or another. Some evidence, the very best available evidence, which is poor evidence, suggests eating earlier in the day is healthier than eating later in the day. I have looked at the study. There's a lot of bias in these studies. Uh, they fail to isolate several important variables. And so if you did multivariate analysis, I don't think the results would stand. And, but if you want to look at it yourself, you are welcome to. This is a recent review. What I have found has worked for patients is eating in a window that works for you. 
what works for your family. If you want to he- eat with your your significant other and you only see them in the afternoon or evening, then have your eating window in the evening. If you're a person that works early in the morning and has a four-hour break during lunch and goes back to work a little bit in the afternoon, then then maybe your eating window needs to be during that four-hour lunch break. So in summary, carbon out has to be greater than carbon in. That means you have to burn more calories than you eat. You can do that by working more or eating less or both. Focus on a low calorie diet, which is a low carbon diet. Don't get into another uh, diet fad like Atkins or low carb or, or low protein or whatever, low fat. You can eat a low fat diet. That's fine as long as it's low calorie as well. So don't focus on any specific macronutrient. Focus on the sum of all three. Eat healthy and balanced. Don't eat simple sugars. Your carbohydrate intake should be complex carbohydrates. If you're going to eat them, eat pastas or oatmeals or whatever. Don't eat sugars or sweeteners. For women, I, I tell them to aim for less than 1,500 Some people would say that less than 1,200 is unhealthy. I have seen data that would suggest anything over 800 is still healthy. I am not recommending to get down to 800. I am saying shoot for less than 1,500 calories per day. Increase the avenues of calorie loss. Now I'm not telling you to get a gastric bypass, which would increase your calories lost in your feces, or I'm not telling you necessarily to to go and get you know some product from Walmart that would help you to also lose those calories in your feces. You can, but you won't have as many friends if you're producing the amount of gas that you're going to produce. I'm recommending intermittent fasting, time-restricted diet, time-restricted fasting, so that you can restrict the amount of calories and lose a little bit of those also in your urine. This also reprograms your brain when your brain starts to use ketones. You actually will feel more energetic, more alive, more happy, more healthy. Do not get to ketourea through a low-carb diet. Do it through fasting. Not you don't not even going to get there through a low calorie diet. You have to get there through fasting. So time restricted fasting, uh, and start with a twelve hour fast. Move to the seven eleven. Eventually get down to the three, and then pff, off them calories. Okay. Last and nextly, uh, reprogramming your appetite. And I haven't talked about this yet, but essentially you're going to eat as often as you're hungry, and you're going to be hungry as often as you eat. It would take you about a month of constantly hammering yourself to say, I'm not going to eat right now, I'm not going to eat right now. And eventually, you will get to a day, a month from when you start, and you'll say, man, I went all day. It's, you know, it's my three-hour eating window. And you look at your clock and say, oh, wow, I am hungry. I, I didn't realize I was hungry before now, and, I did, I know, and then you're going to eat, and you're not going to realize you're hungry after that. Because your brain is going to be rewired after about a month of being constant, same time, every day. And it is going to realize, oh, I'm only hungry during that time now. That's why there used to be this trend, this fad of if you eat small meals several times throughout the day, you'll lose weight. That's not true at all. If you eat 10 meals a day, you're going to get hungry 10 times a day. And you're going to eat full meals 10 times a day. That's just how you're going to do it. So you got to get rid of that, and you got to get down to an eating window. This is just basically regurgitation. If you eat 10 times a day, you're hungry 10 times a day. Eat in a three-hour window, you're hungry in a three-hour window. Expect to have some side effects the first few weeks that you're fasting in a three-hour window. You're going to be hangry. That is part of ketosis, and your brain saying, wait a second, I'm not ready for this. Your brain will rewire itself to be ready for it and you will feel a lot better some people have various effects you can feel fatigued you can feel cold you can feel you can feel just yuck you can feel like you have the flu some people call it the keto flu this is the slang used on the internet to describe this thing 
but you will feel better eventually. You can do other things to reprogram your appetite. There's cognitive behavioral therapy. So you can see a therapist. You can get an, uh, on an app called Noom. I'm not paid by Noom. I'm not paid by any, anyone that does uh, CBT for weight loss either. So I can recommend these things without any reservation. Last of all, stay active. We've been talking about energy intake, energy output. I try to tell people sit less, stand more. Don't sit for more than 30 minutes at a time. Even if you have a desk job, you can stand up for two minutes every 30 minutes. I want you to walk at least 30 minutes a day for at least five or six days a week. And then I want you to do your best to use your muscles because your body can use protein as energy they use protein, fat, and sugar as energy, and you don't want to lose muscle. So the only way to tell your body that that muscle is important and to not lose it, to lose the fat instead, is to use those muscles so that it has a biochemical signal to keep those muscles, okay? Exercise. This doesn't have to be rigorous. It doesn't have to be circuit training. It just has to be you putting in a little more effort into your muscular activity than you normally do already. And then along the lines of the CBT, the cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm just gonna tell you to weigh yourself every day and keep track of the weight. Weight Watchers is a program. It's not what I'm talking about. It's very similar to what I'm talking about. They, they encourage you to weigh yourself every day. Because you weigh yourself every day, you're more likely to lose weight. That, that works through multiple different reasons, but weigh yourself every day. Don't be a weight watcher, but be a watcher of your weight, I guess is what I'm saying. And as you do that, you'll be more encouraged and more motivated and more uh, disappointed when you don't lose weight. Here are some selected citations. I could have pumped in a lot more. I don't think really anybody wants to read these. I want to say thank you for watching the whole thing. Click like and let me know in the comments what you thought. And uh, if you have any questions.